Amen. Well, why don't we stand to our feet? We we'll welcome the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're going to praise Him, worship Him, and a message for us later. And we're going to get into our main praise in a moment. And uh, first, I have a new song I want us to do. We're going to start with that new song and make sure that we get it. And then we're going to go back into this. What happens with the new, I just wrote it this morning. When I write a song freshly, if I do songs, and then by the time I get to it, I totally forget the song. It's a brand new song. I really like it. So tonight is its debut. We're going to go into that after we pray. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Father, we welcome you here in this place. We pray that your will would be done here tonight in each and every one of us. We are your lambs and your sheep gathered to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. The voice of a stranger we will not listen to. So, our ears are open to hear the voice of the Spirit. Let your Spirit speak to us, Lord. Let the Holy Ghost uh, communicate with us tonight. Even when the message is being preached, when testimony is being shared, so, Lord, let our spirits benefit from the information, even what's between the lines. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. We love you and we thank you, Lord. Bless this time. Bless this evening. Feel free, Lord, to show up and show off and heal and change and deliver and encourage your people. You're welcome here tonight, Lord. We love you, Jesus.
place where I love you running There's a place where I sing you songs of
I'm more wonderful, I'm more beautiful, I'm more worthy to receive every word of praise that we sing.
about becoming good ground hearers. I have preached probably 50 times on the parable of the sower. Many different messages. I've read it so many times, again and again and again. Different aspects, different views. I've broken it down. The most uh, memorable message that I've preached, that I enjoyed the most, 
I, I did back in the 1990s into 2000, 2001, 2002. I preached a lot about the parable of the sower applied to the church. It was really when I changed because formerly I thought about the parable of the sower as a parable concerning the world. But then I realized it says people who hear the word. Who's hearing the word but people who come to hear it? All of them receive the seed. So that means that's people in the church. So then I turned that parable and applied it to the church instead of the world. And then my eyes were opened. And God began to show me new things. And that's been through the years. But in reading it, I come across some new things out of it. We're going to read the whole parable together and Jesus' comments about it. Then we're going to break it down. We begin in Luke chapter 8, verse 4. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Now I want you to envision, if you've ever been around a farm, picture a road, and then there's a fence, because if, I spent a lot of time around farms when I was a boy, and then there's usually a pile of discarded material that was cleared from the field at the side of the field. Rocks, and it's hard, you cannot clean there because the rocks do not let you cut the grass, so what happens there is a lot of weeds, the grass grows in there, thorns, the thicket. All of that space there is near, usually the fence line. In many places, in fact, they pile those rocks up to make hedges or actual walls. You'll see this in Ireland and in Scotland. Uh, the stones cleared from fields are used to make barriers around the fields. So this is what this is talking about. But first you have a path that runs along the side. And as the sower is going out, imagine that he's a little bit of a sloppy sower. He's just throwing seed out. Not so specifically put it in one place, but what they would do is prepare the ground and then throw the seed out on the ground. So in this case, some of those seeds are going further than he may have planned for them to go, and they're bouncing out onto the road. That's where he starts. And so what happens is those go there, the birds come, they swoop, they swoop down and see the seed, and they eat it right away. Now, some fell on rocky ground. That's the next thing next to the path, those rocks I talked about. And when it came up, that is when the seed uh, opened and began to grow into a plant, the plants withered because they had no moisture. They're just stuck on the rocks, right? So there's no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which should be part of that hedge grow or part of that, that overabundance of, of uh, vegetation. And it grew up, there was a seed sprouted and opened, but there, because they were so deep in the thicket, they were choked by the other plants. So there was not enough light coming. They were underneath the thorns, underneath those things. So still, other seed fell on good soil. This is the seed that actually made it where the sower wanted it to be, in good ground. It came up and yielded a crop because it had, it could we have roots properly, it was good ground, it was easy to grow, there was no, there was proper light, proper um, irrigation, because it was not in the rocks, but it was in soil that could absorb the moisture. Anyway, I'm over laboring the point, I think you get the picture. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant, because, you know, they want to know what this means, the disciples were not particular geniuses. They, they had a lot of moments when they asked simple questions. Jesus often made fun of them, in fact, for their lack of understanding. He would be wowed and surprised at how little they knew sometimes. Like, really? You don't get this? But he's a little kinder during this parable. So his disciples asked him, what, what does this mean? Why are you telling the people this story? Well, he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. He goes on. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, 
They are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. There is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Right? This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Giving them what? The keys. The secrets. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom. The insider's information that's going to make sure that they're in the right category. He says, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. Now, Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside waiting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Now, all of this together means something important. That's why I read all the verses. The parable of the sower is perhaps the best known of all of the parables that Jesus told. In fact, if I were to put you in a room and just say, what is the parable that Jesus spoke? Most likely, doesn't this come to mind before any other parable of the sower? Why is that? Well, it's because of how much time he spent around it. He put more energy into not just that it's a parable, but even the concept of parables themselves. And this is the reason. It's because it demonstrated the bridge between common hearing and anointed listening. The common hearers are people who hear, everybody can hear the word. Everybody can hear my words and what I speak. But not everyone is going to be able to be changed by that word spoken. So there's common hearing and then there's anointed listening. And we're going to break this down in detail tonight. You can hear something said and lack the understanding. In fact, you can even pretend that you do understand when people are talking to you. Ever do that? And they're talking and talking and talking and you just, yes, yes, and you, you pretend you understand what they're saying. Perhaps they're using a vocabulary you don't know. Maybe because I've learned different languages in different nations, sometimes when you're learning, you get so tired of stopping the poor nationals to say, I didn't quite understand that. You just start after a while saying, yes, yes. And I have agreed to do some of the most outrageous things because I just kept saying, yes, yes. And they're, they're will you do this? Will you come 16 hours to my village and pray for my donkey? And I'm like, yes, yes. And they come to pick me up like the next week. And, okay, it's time to go. I'm like, where are we going? Well, you said you would go pray for the donkey. And I'm like, well, I didn't say I go, yes, the other day. I said, we, and you just said, yes, yes. So you know what I had to do? I had to go pray for the donkey. I've prayed for donkeys. I've prayed for camels. I've, I've prayed for goats. I've prayed for sheep. I've prayed for houses. I've prayed for wells. I've prayed for ground where there no, were no wells so that it would be blessed so they could dig a well. I pray for everything. Half of the occasions I did so because I said, yes, yes, yes. But anyway, you know, conversely, you can hear something said and fully comprehend it. And what is the difference? And how can we obtain the revelation that conveys us or carries us to a whole new life in Jesus? Because these words that Jesus is speaking are life. And they have the potential and the power to transform any human heart from the inside out. And the only difference from the ones that totally become transformed by the Word and those that do not are how they listen. So we're going to go into this message. The power of the Sower shows us four categories of hearers that I believe represent four groups of people found in the church because they're all hearing the Word. The church is where we go to hear the words of God spoken, the seeds of eternal life sown into the lives of the people. Every Sunday night, you come here, those who do come, and I put these words on the wall that are Scripture, and you know that I don't just 
pop this stuff out like an hour before the meeting comes. This is through meditation and prayer and the anointing. The Spirit of the Lord comes on me. I'm often weeping, shaking, crying, dreams and visions. He gives me this information. I'm just saying this to let you know when I give you a message, it's not just Stephen's idea. It's deeper and it's bigger than that. It is what God is trying to convey to us as a social gathering, the church gathered together. But what you get out of it is really has nothing to do with me. I can be the most talented speaker that I can be. Put it in the most eloquent and palatable format possible. Be as articulate as I can to you and make it as simple as I can. But you can still walk out of the door without having received anything from it. Because really it's your responsibility to know how to listen to. And this is what I'm talking about. Only one of these groups go on to be the productive, God-pleasing people that will populate heaven. And this is important. We need to do all that we can to ensure that we are in that group. How many of you want to be in that group? Uh, when I, we were children, we were part of you know sports culture in our home city of New Orleans, and we had a, a football team there called the New Orleans Saints. And we took this old Christian song about, um, oh, and the saints come marching in. Oh, and the saints go marching in. I want to be right there in that number. That's what I think when I think about that. That 75% of the people in this parable that it's talking about are not in that number. But I want to be in the number of the saints of the good ground here. And so, if you want this too, I want us to look at seven important keys to open the door of understanding of God's words. How many of you are interested in this message? Like every message, you now have the opportunity to escape before we begin. No one will notice. You can get out before because remember, once the words are given over to you, you are therefore responsible with reacting to these words. The pressure is now on you. Amen? How many of you receive that and say, Stephen, I'm going to do my best job to listen tonight? Good, because this message is not going to help you to do that. Seven important keys. Number one, there are secrets available for all believers, how many of you like secrets? Everybody loves a secret. When your friend comes in and you know they they get this look on their face, and you're like, "What?" Nothing. <laughs> no, you got to something. Tell me what happened. What? No, no, no. I can't talk about it. <laughs> Charge you crazy, doesn't you? Like, no, you got to tell me. It's just no. It's, I'm not supposed to talk about it, which. And they say that makes it worse. <laughs> well, just tell me. Give me a hint. I can't even give you a hint. It's so big and so wonderful. It's, I just, uh, I can't tell you. And they make it worse and worse because they have a secret. And that's what all these people were around Jesus. They could tell, and I'm sure there was even jealousy concerning the relationship that Jesus had with these disciples that were very close to them. And how many of you know that when Jesus told them this, they were very excited to know, hey, we're on the inside. We're the inside group. He said in verse 10, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. All the people who come to hear the words of God are eligible candidates to become good ground hearers. I'm going to use that term good ground here throughout the message because that's that 25% of people in the parable that you and I want to become. So we will become good ground hearers. There is nobody who is predisposed or predestined to not be a good ground hearer. Everybody has equal right, potential, and possible access to the deepest revelations of God. Everybody. He is no, he doesn't make exception of some individuals as different. He is no respecter of persons. It would not be biblical if somebody said, well, I'm able to get more revelation than other people. Maybe they do get more revelation than other people. I get a lot of revelation. But there's reasons why I get a lot of revelation, which I'm going to talk about in this message. There are people who seem more apt to just pull things out of the Word. Have you ever people read the Bible with somebody and they just seem better at seeing things? And that's good. Maybe there's a gift on them to see things because the Lord is cultivating them to be teachers and speakers. But it does not mean that they have something that you cannot have. Everybody is eligible to receive the deepest secrets of God's kingdom. But it depends upon you. And the difference between the ones uh, that become good ground hearers and those that are in the other three categories is caused by the actions 
of the ears themselves and not the sovereignty of God. And in the parable, the picture is spoken. But if you go back and read the description that Jesus gave to the disciples, you'll see that it is all choices that those people made concerning life surrounding the seed received. All received the seed. But what happened with the seed by action of those people is the outcome that they had as far as being productive or not. And I know we all want to be productive. We all have the same opportunities offered by Jesus to truly listen and learn from His revelations. That's the first. Number two, we must cultivate a noble and good heart to become a good ground here. When we crossed that verse a moment ago, did you, did you notice those words? Started to give us insights in verse 15. But the seed on good soil, now he's, he first mentioned those other seeds, seed on the road, seed um, amongst the rocks, amongst the thorns, and he went by those relatively quickly. They did not have much chance. But then he got to these. You know, the seeds on the good soil, well, that stands for those with a noble and good heart. Now, I want to talk about this because it's important that you understand it is your obligation to cultivate this. Winsomely good and intrinsically good is what the Greek says. I've never heard the word winsomely. This is a new word for me. I love it. Winsomely. You can check it. It's a real word. So winsomely good and intrinsically good is exactly what the Greek words say when it says there in, specifically in the verse, it says a noble and a good heart. So I want to break these down. Winsomely good first. The word noble means to be worthy of hearing by actions of your intent listening and focus. It means paying a price that earns the credit of reward from God in the form of eye-opening influence. I know those are a lot of words. They get a little confusing, but I'm really trying to labor what it means. A winsome means this noble heart is a heart that's paid the price to be a receiver of the word. You think, what kind of price? Well, we have to cultivate our heart by focusing on the words of God as they are discovered to us through our hearing. We hear with this, you know, we have um, five senses. One of them is hearing, very important. By sight, of course, we do many things, but we hear the Word of God. The words are spoken. God's whole kingdom is built on words. His words are valuable. Though they are spoken to us from the Scriptures, but there are also prophetic words that come. There's things that are quoted in context that are helpful to us, and it all depends on how we hear it. If we develop our heart, we cultivate our heart by focusing on these words, taking them seriously. Imagine that God's words are communicated during wartime that will save you and your division from impending death. You have this little ring with the crackly sound of the bass talking to you. You know, that sound. And you have to tune it in very carefully because you are in a place in the jungle in the middle of a war. I'm sure you've seen war movies and you know how that is. And one simple report from some eyewitness could tell you where the enemies have lied in wait in ambush. They're wanting to destroy you. One communicate can save you from death and also the death of those around you. If you have the right mentality about God's Word, otherwise you're not going to pay attention. But how many of you know if you knew that life and death was on the line and you needed to receive a message and understand it, how important would that message become? It would become the most important message you've ever heard. That is God's Word. God's Word is the only thing that can save us. It merits our full attention. So we work, we cultivate our hearts, we build them up because these are the words of life that will save us. Noble heart means winsomely good. It is earning, it is worthy, is what it's saying. And I know we build a lot of, well, you know, we don't, we don't have to be worthy because God's grace is there. I'm just telling you what the Greek says. It says a worthy heart. A winsomely good heart. A heart that's paid the price and deserves because it paid the price to pay attention. Winsomely good. We go to the next one, intrinsically good. This means a heart found to be valuable and of its in and of its own merit. A heart with considered worth due to its motivations and choices. 
Now, heart is you. you. You have the heart, but it is the center of you, cardia in the Greek, the center of your being. It is part of your soul. Your mind, your emotions, and your will come from the inside of you. You cultivate your heart by yielding to the Spirit's impulses to do right and the right thing in life concerning those around us. One of the things that he's saying, and this is Jesus' words, he said the ones that are the good ground hearers that go on to have success by the way they hear, there, there is a system of blessing that comes to them to help them understand more because they have given their lives over in service to people. Intrinsically good-hearted people. They do good to all people, especially those of the household of faith. How many of you know that in light of what Cynthia shared and what she's done right now in her heart, this is her heart. She's laid her life down. She's gone out there. Uh, she's, not, she's not becoming a millionaire out there. She's working, laboring. She's rolling. We do not pay her to make tortillas. It is all, she has a basic support from the church, but she's doing that out of love, and now she's, she's got it. She sees the connect that we've discovered through 30 years. That's what we're trying to pass on to you guys, to see that you just work, you labor, and it's not the labor. If you look at the work, you'll miss the whole point. The work is the field. It's not the treasure hidden in the field. The treasure hidden in the field is the relationships with the people that cause them to come to Christ. And so therefore you will sell everything and invest everything to buy that field. And that field is her rolling pin. And that gives her this heart. So therefore God's taking special notice of her when she sits in a room like this and hears a message. She has an advantage over people who maybe are not doing the level of service that she's doing in the work of the gospel. And I'm not saying that to you to make you feel bad, but I'm telling you that this definitely has something to do with it. And I found the more I serve, the more I labor and give my life over to the work of the gospel in serving humanity, the more revelations are popping out of the scriptures to me. And this is what I believe Jesus is trying to tell us here. Winsomely good and transitively good. Number three. There are four incremental steps to becoming a good ground here. These are embedded in that verse that we saw. We go to the verse 15. But the seed on good soil stands for those who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Let's break these four things down. Hear, retain, persevere, produce. Hear, retain, persevere, produce. You want to know how to get from being just any old here to someone who is actually called the good ground here that is growing and learning that Jesus is happy to point out and say, this is my guide, this is, your, this is your goal to become this, this is how you do it. Everybody does the first step in the parable. Everybody's hearing it, but not everybody's retaining it. Some of them are hearing and retaining, but then there's no perseverance. Because when the tests and trials of this world come, they don't pass the tests. They abandon the principles of the word that they learn in place of a system that this world teaches them because that's what's popular to do because all your friends are doing it and you don't want to make waves, all these little things. But the good ground here is the only one that reaches productivity. And ultimately, if we couple this with the parable of the talents, God measures you by what you've done with what he's given you. He gives you the talents. He goes away and watches what you're going to do with them, and then he comes back, and if you have multiplied them, if you show productivity in them, then he will bless you and give you even more. That's where spiritual growth comes from. But this is how you do it through hearing the word. You hear it, you retain it, which means you hold on to it. You persevere. No matter how hard it is, you focus, you try. When you read your Bible, for instance, you're hearing it. You can go click me every day and I will read the Bible to you. And as you hear it, you can sit there and be more interested in the way the tea leaves are settling in the bottom of your cup than what I'm saying. How many of you have been guilty of that? I've done that to my own recording. <laughs> Caught myself playing with my coffee and realized I missed the whole New Testament portion. And I back it up and go, why? Because I was hearing, but I wasn't listening. And retention depends on your level of listening. But that means that you put out all obstacles. This is the noble heart. This is the one winsomely because it's paying a price. 
to here and then hold on to it, retain it, stop it and think. When I listen to the recording, because sometimes I listen to my own recording, sometimes I read it, I will stop it constantly. Play a little bit and stop it. Why? Because if you just read it, I realize that you're probably just reading the whole thing and check you did your religious obligation. That's good. That's, that's good. But I'm telling you, there's, there's more you can do. If you want to move into the level of retention, you stop it. You think, hmm. Because something occurs to you in the moment that you read the Scripture, but then you're more concerned about time. You're more concerned about the pressures of life. You understand that you're stepping out of the good ground category and into the thorns and into the rocks when you do that. But if you take the time and retain it, then you know that. Then you go into the perseverance where you hold on to it, you believe it, you live it even when it's difficult and it's hard and it's not popular when it separates you from your friends and you live the word no matter what. Then you become a productive believer. And that is the, the harvest the Lord is looking for in you. That productivity. Number four. Association with Jesus does not make you a good ground here. If you just because you are near Jesus... Just because you come to church, it does not mean you're good ground here. And I want you to consider it now in light of what he just told the disciples. Look what he goes on to say. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside waiting to see you. He replied, my mother and my brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. That he was not impressed by the family ties. The blood was not thicker than water that day. That they were outside. Oh, your mother, your oh, I'm sorry guys, I have to stop teaching. My mother and my brothers are here. I'm going to go take care of them because they're special. He said, no, my mother and brothers are those that hear God's words. The ones that come here and have paid the price to listen carefully and pay attention. Mary at his feet on the ground while Martha is, is saying, make her work. Make her do something. Those are the ones that are the hearers. He said, that's my mother and my brothers. Why? Because just because you're near Jesus, just because you, you are related to Jesus, does not give you automatic access to what He's doing. So your mother and your brothers are outside. Now, just because the family of Jesus had been with Him for His early life in close proximity did not give them good ground hearer status. It's not how much time you spend in church as much as it is how you listen to what is being spoken in church. It's not even whether you are hearing what's being spoken in church. But it's how you're hearing what's being spoken in church. Number five. <laughs> Revelation will be revealed to someone. You understand? You can't stop it. I am anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When I speak and preach, the words that are coming out of my mouth carry power. If nobody here listens to them, they still will convey them. It's, they're going to bear fruit. God's words, once they go out, it says it in the Bible, right? That once His word is spoken, it will not return void. It will do something. Because it inherently has so much power. So when it's spoken, somebody's going to get blessed. And this is what Jesus goes on to say. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Now how many of you ever read this verse and you felt guilty that your sins were going to be exposed? Why do we conclude that in light of what he's teaching? He, he not once is speaking in this entire context about sins or the things you hide or your dark secrets or your nasty little habits. He's only talking about the Word, the Word, the understanding of the Word, the good ground hearers. He said there's nothing hidden. And what did He say to them in the beginning? The secrets are given to you. It might be hidden to them, but it's not hidden to the ones that listen carefully. The ones that are the good ground ones, they're the ones of the noble heart. They're the ones that are paying attention. Those are the ones that are paying a price to absorb everything no matter what. I wish you could have seen me when I first got saved. Well, you can still see me. Forever. You don't get to see me sit in a preaching um, message very often. But I, I was just like him right there. See that? That's the proper posture right there. I'm not kidding. That was me in every single meeting. Edge of my seat, forward. 
If I miss this, I'm going to hell. So I'm going to pay real close attention. Remember when, when Pastor Solomon was here? Where was I? What was I doing? Sitting in the front row. Mouth hanging open. Sucking up every word. I don't have a chance that often to hear the word like you guys do. And when I do, I'm like a vacuum. When I get one-on-one -on -one with pastors or revelations and preach, I drill them. We talk, okay, and I, I take off, I roll up my sleeves, no. Okay, you say you have this revelation. Where did you get it from? What is the scripture? How did this? Where did this come from? What did you preach last week? I get a whole year's messages from pastors when they're visiting me like that. I just pull it all out. Pull it all out because I want to hear it. There's nothing hidden and that will not be disclosed, which means there can be disclosure of anything concerning revelation. You get what he's saying? <laughs> and nothing concealed that will not be known and brought out into the open, but for who? For the people who make sure that they don't miss it and don't take no for an answer and say, I will get the revelation. Oh, but it's kind of hard to see. I don't care how hard it is to see. I just got a promise from Jesus that there's nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. I have passages of the Bible that have plagued me for 30 years because I still don't have revelation. So what do you do? I, every year I hit them again. I hit them again. I hit them again. I've got revelations this past year from passages I have read over a hundred times and got nothing from. But I keep going. I keep going. Why? Because I have a promise that nothing hidden, that there's nothing in his body of, in, in his intellectual property given to man in the Word, there's nothing encrypted or hidden that we cannot receive. That's exciting. Nothing concealed will not be known or brought out into the open. So I look at my Bible knowing that it is a treasure chest with so many things hidden between those verses and those words that if I just hang on, it will be open because a promise from God's Word says nothing hidden will not be disclosed. It will be uncovered. Just have to hang in there and wait. You say, well, what is it going to take? It might take you knowing 50 other scriptures to unlock that one scripture. Honestly, that's probably the most common thing that causes me to understand things I didn't understand before because I understood a bunch of other stuff. And then all the pieces of a puzzle came together. Ever build a puzzle? Did you ever get a puzzle with too many pieces and regret having bought the one with that many pieces? <laughs> I should have got the 250 piece. But no, you got like the 8,000 piece. You know, that's like four meters wide and, and, and the pieces are like this. Big and it's horrible. You can't you can't tell what anything is, and sometimes we feel like that in the Bible. But if you put enough pieces in place, it takes you years just to get the, all the flat-edged pieces together on your Bible reading, so that you have the frame of what God's knowledge is. Years until finally you get all those little flat-edged pieces and you put those verses together, and then at least you have borders or parameters to the full knowledge of God's truth. Then you start filling in by colors and shapes. That's exactly what it is, an analogy that I use to see how am I receiving revelation from the Word. So you've got to keep going, keep digging, keep looking. Because it will be brought out into the open for the ones who have that noble heart, that winsomely good heart that's going to pay whatever price it takes. And it's so funny, there's so many Christians that want revelation and they don't even read their Bibles. Not just reading your Bible, it's meditating on your Bible, consuming what the Word of God says. It will be revealed to somebody. The revelation of God is all powerful, and just as He is omnipotent, heaven and earth will pass away, but the words of God have no expiry date. They are the only things that we can carry into eternity. Because they are eternally capable to exist. Everything else is going to burn. Wood, hay, stubble, worthless. No matter how many assets you acquire, no matter how many properties or things you get, no matter what, the only thing that we can carry with us is the Word of God. So therefore, why do we place value on so many other things and not as much value on God's holy words? I love what Cynthia said a little while ago. Her Bible... Her, but I'm with you, honey. I love Bible. I love. I cry sometimes. I I look at the Bible and I just start crying. Not because of a revelation, but because it's there. 
And I get it that I have been given the secrets of eternity. God has given me His Word. So this is the, what it is. They are the only things that we can carry. To know God is to know His words. To know God is to have eternal life. So therefore we can conclude to have eternal life is to know His words. The more you know His words, the more you have. We say, what about me right now? I'm kind of new at the Word. I don't know a whole lot. Believe me, even one verse. i tell you what it takes to get saved. It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. I'm going to show you the shortest sinner's prayer that can get you into heaven. Jesus! That's enough. The Bible says it. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved. And there are people in bus accidents and motorcycle accidents, they get saved just screaming Jesus in that last moment of their lives. If you're in a lift and you hear cling, 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 and you start screaming Jesus, Jesus! Jesus! Yell it out. Well, people are going to think I'm crazy. You know, they might start screaming Jesus too. Yeah, Jesus! <laughs> Get enough people screaming Jesus in a broken lift, it might flew. <laughs> to know God is to have eternal life. If we do not become good ground hearers of His words, someone else will. And that's what it says. It's going to be disclosed. In fact, the things that have been potentially revealed and offered to us will be taken away and passed to someone who will be responsible with them. If this trend continues, we will end up empty-handed as we approach eternity. I, I don't want to do that. You understand, this is in light of what the Scriptures talk about and what Jesus is saying in His Word about the ones that, that have and don't have and it's taken away from some and given to others, the parable of the talents, all those things. Why is that? Because the ones that pay the price and multiply the talents, or in this case, the revelation of the Word of God. You take a verse, it's not just a verse to you, but it becomes a ten-part teaching series. That's Any verse to me can become a Bible school um, theology course. You give me one verse and I can teach it for a year. Because you dig into each word and it just life starts coming and coming and coming if you pay attention and there's going to be somebody responsible. God's going to find who's responsible and He's going to give it to them. Go to the next. Number six. We have two more. There are different ways that we can listen to something. There's different methods is what I'm thinking here. It says, therefore, consider carefully. Now this is interesting, this wording. Therefore, consider carefully what you hear. Now, everybody's hearing the same thing. You can have 20 people in a room hearing the same message, the same words, but each person is using a different method of listening. And this is what Jesus says. He's pointing to His disciples and saying that you want to get this right, be careful and pay close attention, consider carefully how you listen. The way that you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what they think they have will be taken from them. All depending on the method you use in listening. This is scary. Pastors would thank me to preach this message in their churches. Because I guarantee you, the Sunday following this message, every person in the church would... They'd get pumped up full of coffee before they came in. Make sure they're not sleepy, that they don't miss a single word. And I'm not giving this to you because I want you to pay close attention because you guys do and we have a great time together. And I, I feel very happy. I feel vindicated by the teachings that I give from the people. But if we can get more out of it, you understand, if we can press in and get even more, what if your method of smelting the ore produces 30% more gold? How much more valuable will your industry become in the industry of smelting ore for gold? I mean, that's a strange thing, but whatever the case. NASA just figured out how to produce 75% oxygen return on recycled oxygen. That's up 25%. You know I'm going to go somewhere in space. They can produce now more oxygen. You understand, when we're doing deep space missions that are coming, and it's curious, and I don't, I don't know, Jesus will probably come back before we get far enough. But they are figuring out ways. Whoever invented that system on how to make oxygen recycle that much more, there's value to that. It's the same when it comes to the most valuable commodity we have, which is the revelation of God. So consider carefully 
Think about it. For one to consider carefully how he or she listens is the most pertinent key to comprehension and fulfillment of the words of Jesus. And remember, only the ones that hear his words and put them into practice are the ones that have their house built on a rock. Everybody else is on the sand. The winds come, the rains fall, the water, they're all falling. But the ones who do this, there are many different ways that we listen to things. Your subconscious hears things even when you are asleep. Did you ever hear those people that play tapes all night? And so they can hear. I actually did that. I did that for years. We, my wife and I would go to sleep at night and we had a cassette player and we would put the Bible on cassette. We would play it uh, about you know low volume through the night, all night we'd play while we slept. Did you know I'd wake up every morning with things in my head that came out of the Bible just for me. Because you can actually, now this is not the most intense method. I don't read your Bible this way. <laughs> that wasn't the only way I read the Bible. That was just another echelon of the way. I had many ways. I diversified the ways that I listened to the Bible. I studied it intently. But I also played it through the night. I did this for a while. Although you may accept a part of the information, you most likely would not be able to repeat it, but it's still gone into your subconscious. That's one way, but there's more. Considering carefully. Now this means to scrutinize and study through focus and repetition. The furthest extreme to this would be to memorize the words. The Jews were told to write the laws of God down on little pieces of paper and to wear them on their bodies and nail them to their doorposts. Look at the scripture. Deuteronomy 11, 18. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. That is memorization. How else can you do it? But you actually verse memory. And I got serious. Not only did I listen to the tape all night, but also I had a campaign of Bible memorization and I did it in King James. And I memorized chapter after chapter after chapter. I know whole, I have whole books memorized from some portions. The book of James, I can recite whole chapters, but very King Jamesy. If you don't mind thee and thou and superfluity of naughtiness, then I can, I can quote it to you. But I, I was putting it in the best way that I could. And this is what he says. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and your minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Tie them on your forehead. The Jews, the Hasidic Jews, still to this day do this. They take the scriptures, they put them on paper, they fold it up like little origami shapes, they put it in a little sack, put it on their head and tie a string and tie it to their forehead. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Go online, look it up. And they tie it to their hands, and they bind it on themselves, and they go to the, to the prayer wall in Jerusalem, and they pray. Go look at them. You'll see the scriptures actually strapped to their bodies. Now, we don't have to quite do it that way, but it, it wouldn't hurt. We have art in our houses. I'm, I'm all for putting scriptures in your house. Put Bible verses everywhere. I like the, I had this whole series of songs I used to listen to that were Bible verses. Sung. Just pure Bible sung. And it helped me memorize a lot of scriptures. And our, our church, in, when we first got saved, I was in a church that all of our songs were only scripture. And, and every one of the songs were, were scripture. It was like we constantly were singing the Bible. And you know, then we had the, the vineyard movement came along. And everybody started singing more arty songs and kind of like the songs I write that are more like poetry that are employing biblical references. And so it's still the Bible, but no, we used to sing the Bible. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. This tells me God wants you to consider carefully the Word. Constantly. And then it be what comes out of your mouth all the time. I like Malachi 3.16. And the Lord heard those that talked often to one another about Him. And He prepared a special memorial for them in eternity. And He says, these are my special ones, my treasure. One translation says, these are my treasure. Because they talked, as it said, when you walk all the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And, you know, Bible memorization is good. It's good to do this. It is not a law. We're not required to do it. But you do need to figure some way to more carefully read the Word. Now, we're going to end with this, number seven. A good ground here hears with spirit ears. I'm going to give you the New Testament 
advantage that we have for hearing. Not even the disciples had what we have. You understand? Because the disciples were before the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They did not yet have, they had Jesus with them personally and that was quite an advantage. But Jesus himself said, man, you know what? It's better for you if I go away. So if I go away, the Comforter, the Helper is coming. The Parakletos, the one called alongside to help, the Advocate is coming, and he's going to remind you of everything I ever said. Jesus said it, didn't he? Because whatever Jesus spoke, being the Word alive and incarnate, the Holy Spirit, his primary function is to repeat that to you in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, constantly. He will give it to you. The disciples didn't have that. We have it today, though, because we have the Holy Spirit with us. Let's look at the Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. My favorite passage of Scripture concerning this, and we're going to end with this. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature. Now, he just got finished talking about some Christians that he had a problem with because of the immaturity by choice. He said, you guys aren't ready for milk yet. You're drinking milk. I mean, um, for meat, you're drinking milk. And then he used the analogy like a baby drinks milk and can't eat meat. So a new Christian has to drink milk. And that's okay for a season, but you know, if you are 18 years old and you're still um, breastfeeding, it's a little awkward. You should be eating substantial food at that time. And this is what he's saying is the analogy. But he says, however, there are those of us who are growing and learning and we speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age. You know, that was already qualified that the wisdom of this age is foolishness to God. Of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom. A mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. The aforementioned things that will be uncovered, Jesus said that's been encrypted in the plan of God since before the earth was ever made. But there's a key to unlocking it. None of the rulers of this age understood it, he said. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived in its natural capacity, the things God has prepared for those who love Him, which things? He just qualified what they were. The mystery that has been hidden, the God destined for our glory before time began. That message of wisdom. Don't, if whatever you know about this passage, ignore it right now and go with me. It's talking about a message of wisdom. That is a spoken word. A message. What is a message? You get them on your phone all the time. That somebody communicated with you words. This message of wisdom comes to you. God prepared those for the ones that love Him. He prepared these messages. What no human has conceived what no ear has heard before, these hidden mystery things, these are the things God has revealed to us. How? By His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Did you know that there's deep things of God? If there's deep things, there's shallow things. And everybody likes the shallow things. But not everybody likes the deep things. I like the deep, deep things. Things. I watched a documentary last night about James Cameron, the maker of the movie Titanic. He created the sub. He spent, he took millions and millions of the dollars he got from making the movie Titanic. And he built the world's deepest seagoing submersible in history. And he went down, he broke all records and went to the deepest place. And there was nothing down there. But <laughs> he did it. And he broke the record. There are deep things, there are shallow things, and God, the shallow things are easy. Shallow things are easy to find. Deep things that, that requires more energy, more work, more difficulty. And so those things are available to us. Why? Because these are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In other words, if I went to Benju and I wanted to know everything about him, everything, no, nothing hidden, how could I find out every, even things that he's told, no one ever? If I had some type of device or mechanism that I could put on his head and a helmet and some cables and a laptop and it could suck his spirit out, 
I know that sounds really scary. <laughs> if I could get his spirit and then sequester his spirit in a chamber somewhere and like give it truth serum, and it had to tell me everything about Ben. How many of you know that it knows more about Ben than Ben knows about Ben? It's a fact. Your spirit knows everything. This is what he said. Who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, <laughs> no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. <laughs> what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. That is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. It is the desire of the Holy Ghost to reveal everything to you. The Holy Spirit is dying to tell you and share with you the deep things of God, the deepest revelations. The Spirit is saying, I have secrets, I have treasures, I have so many things I want you to hear. If you just take the time to listen to me, there's nothing I don't know about God. <laughs> The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? And this is based upon what he said earlier about understanding who knows but the spirit of someone knows everything about them. So the spirit of God knows all things. So then how can we then get the spirit? The spirit gives us the mind of the Lord. It says, but we have the mind of Christ. And you may think, I didn't know I had the mind of Christ. <laughs> I'm telling you. Do you understand? You get a revelation of this. Do you understand? And, and you activate that. That my, I have, not the mind that is an enemy. There's different minds. The, there's a carnal mind, the fleshly mind, that what is an enemy of God. It says it can't even be trusted. But then there's the mind of Christ. God's spirit in operation in your mental capacity right now. This is the seventh key and the most important one. How do we become good ground hearers? We have the Holy Spirit. Four facts about spiritual healing. The message of wisdom comes. It's revealed to us by His Spirit. The person without the Spirit does not accept things. If you don't have the Spirit, you, you can't get it. That, because it's the most important key. It's like going to a mighty fortress where all treasures are hidden. And it has one of those very complex lock systems with like 20 keys. You can unlock every key, but if there's one key left, one thing, and you don't have the key to open it, it still does not matter how many other locks you unlock. And this is the key key. <laughs> the key to the key. The most important is the Holy Spirit in you. The mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Christ. Becoming good ground here. Seven important keys. This is what we saw tonight. Number one, there are secrets available for all believers. Don't you stop looking until you find them because they're there. How many parables does it say the one that keeps looking, and keeps looking, keeps knocking, keep knocking, you knock and knock and knock until the door is open. You seek and seek and seek until it's found. When you can't find that one lost coin, you search and search and search. If there's something in the Bible that bothers you because you don't know it, then you need to go after it because that's the Holy Spirit testing you and saying, you know what, you can find this out because it's available to you. It might take you years to get it. But you go for it. Go after it. 
We must cultivate a noble and a good heart to become a good crown Christian, we saw. Winsomely good. Intrinsically good. Do good to people. Bless, love people. God will help you and reveal a word to you. Number three, there are four incremental steps to becoming. Remember we saw that you hear, you retain. Then you just hang in there, persevere. If you do, you will produce. The word will multiply. If you look at my life and think, well, have you multiplied the word given to you? Absolutely. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times the revelations I've received I have given out and they have changed lives around the world. And I'm just getting started. Remember, association with Jesus does not make you a good ground here just because you're related to Jesus. It's the ones who hear the word. No matter how many times you go to church, it's the ones who hear my word and put it into practice, he told them. Remember, revelation will be revealed to somebody. If it's not you, it's going to move right past you. Jesus is like a great, his work, his ministry, his kingdom is like a massive vessel. It's moving forward. You either get on it or get run over by it. God's kingdom will not be stopped. I want to be in it and on it. And to do that, I need to know these secrets. Number six, there are different ways that we can listen to something. Cultivate, diversify your listening portfolio. Listen as many ways as you can. Some of you are probably going to go start playing Bible tape through the night. <laughs> I hope you do. I hope you do. It works. Some of you might think, you know what, I need to start memorizing the Scriptures. Yes, you do. You should. At least some verses. There's key verses that you just need to know that you tuck down into your heart. The Bible said it. A good ground here hears with spirit ears. The Holy Spirit is here with us tonight. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you to receive an anointing to hear. It's the Spirit that opens your ears. The most important thing that you can receive to be a good ground here, as we saw, was the seventh and final one. I saved the best for last. The Holy Spirit. God's Spirit is on you. He blesses you. He fills you. If you are here tonight and you said, you know what, I would simply like you to pray for me to receive an anointing to be able to hear better than ever before, I want you to quickly stand to your feet. I expected everyone to be kind of embarrassing and not stand up at an invitation. No, Pastor, I don't want to have the anointing to hear. Of course you do. We all want to hear. Father, I pray for those that have stood up as a sign proving to you that they are waiting now huh, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to go in them to activate and to amplify their ability to perceive and hear the words of Revelation. Right where you are right now, just raise your hands up toward heaven. Once again, that faith motion toward Him like antennas. Lord, I will not walk away tonight without receiving this anointing that's in the room. God's Spirit is here and He's come to invest in you this ability here in a new way. To you in this room. To you the secrets, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God are given now. The Spirit of the Lord upon you. Right now where you are, if you feel the anointing of the Lord on you, just receive yield to God's Spirit as He works from the inside out. Some of you have a problem with paying attention. You find that you lose focus very easily. God said He's going to fix it. He's going to give you a mind like a steel trap to be able to hold on and retain the words that you hear, therefore bringing you to a level of perseverance in the Word so that you will be more productive. It is His anointing. It is His power. Lord, invest in your children tonight. Your spirit, your power, your glory, your anointing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. So wonderful, so Lord. I mean, if you learned something from God's word tonight.
saw his presence this morning for his glory. His anointing into this place. It's thick. It's rich. It's delicious. Just huh. taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You're glorious, Lord. You're glorious. You're wonderful. The word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. We will bind these things, fix these things in our minds and in our hearts. We metaphorically are strap them to our bodies, on our heads, on our hands. We will nail them to our doorposts. Give us a hunger for your word, Lord. A hunger for your word. The way. Consider carefully. Consider carefully the way that you listen. So important. It's so important. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Wonderful King. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing a song together. Let's worship the Lord for just a moment.
staff that are caring for us and the team that works to get the food ready. I want us to consider what the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, it says that he, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It was given for all of us. This is my body, he said, that's broken for you. Take and eat it, remembering what I've done for you. And at the right time, he then took the cup. And he said, this is the new wine. This is the wine of the covenant. It is my blood. Partake in this. Without the shedding of that blood, without the understanding of what the blood does for us, the sins will remain. But we know that he is the one that died for us, the Lamb. And just as he told us to do so tonight, we're going to drink together from the cup. We're going to eat the bread. And we're going to remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that was made for us. As we fellowship, as we as we speak to one another about your word. This is the Bible told us to do. We're going to, in our rising up and our lying down, we're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about the things of the scriptures. Teach us your words. Bless our bread, bless our water, take sickness out of the midst of us, and bless our time of fellowship. Holy Spirit, now don't be a stranger. <laughs> Stay with us everywhere we go and everything we do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.